So hello and welcome to our holiday book showcase. As you're coming in today, we are grateful that you have chosen to invest part of your day with us and we'll be getting started in just a few moments. Uh, a couple of notes as we begin, we would love to interact with you today during the chat or in the chat. And so I would invite you at this time to find the chat and we would love to have you say hello. And we will be recording today's event. We are recording this event. And so in the event that you would like to share this event, Event with others later, we will welcome you to do so. So thank you. I see that many are coming in. We're so glad that you chose uh, to be with us today for the Holiday Book Showcase. And if you could take a quick moment in the chat to let us know what motivated you to come today. Um, we'd love to know, are you interested in exploring some of these books for your holiday giving? Um, are you are you a weaving influence groupie who comes to every event we do? Um, are you particularly drawn to one of these authors? So tell us in the chat, you know, why are you here? Uh, we would love to know um, because this is an experiment. We've never done a virtual holiday book showcase before. And we want to make sure that in the future, as we plan events, we plan events that will be fun and interesting for you. So if you could take a moment to say hi in the chat, we would love to know where you're calling in from and what prompted you to sign up for today's event. So as I mentioned, I have an amazing and esteemed group of authors with me today, and uh, we will be going in the order of the books and the covers as you see them on the screen. So we'll be starting today with Susan Fowler. We also have David Taylor Klaus. Uh, we have Nikki Groom. We have Denise DeStazzi. We have Charles Bergman and Susan and man. And we also have, uh, for the first time ever on a Weaving Influence program, a fiction author. We have Laura Starks. So um, it's great to see a few groupies. Hi, Roy and Dick. Um, nice to see you. And um, I hope that today will be an interesting event for all of you who have joined. And we look forward to your feedback as this is the first of two events. So I'm going to turn it over to Susan Fowler in just a moment. And uh, what the plan for today is that we'll be going through each of the books in turn. Each author will have a chance to share with you about their book, and we will have some time for Q&A at the end of the event and a lot of other resources. And I may have promised some giveaways, so I'll tell you more about that toward the end of the hour as well. So thanks again for being with us, and I'm going to turn this over to Susan at this point. Susan, it's always great to be with you, but I think you'll need to unmute. You know what? Every time I see someone do that on television, I go, aren't they professionals? Shouldn't they unmute their phones before they do anything? <laughs> anyway, hi, this is Susan Fowler, and I'm kickstarting the holidays from San Diego. And I can't think of a better way to do it than to talk about books. Um, two of the books that I'd like to share with you today are books that I've published with Barrett Kohler, my favorite publisher. And the first one that I, I published with them in 2014 is Why Motivating People Doesn't Work and What Does. And this was particularly um, geared for managers, teachers, parents who have the um, motivational dilemma of trying to motivate people. And the fact is you can't, but you can really understand what the science of motivation tells us about creating an environment and, um, and being able to talk to and, and ask questions in ways that tap into people's psychological needs. The second book that I just published recently is called Master Your Motivation. And this is written for anyone. And it, it's um, something I'm really proud of because uh, for over 20 years, I've been studying the science of motivation, uh, really delving deeply into research, actually doing primary research, being published in academic journals and trying to interpret really complicated, valid, reliable, and astonishing contemporary science and making it usable for people. And what started my quest in this was, and maybe some of you can relate to this, was, um, well, over 40 years ago, um, I uh, overnight became a vegetarian. Now, I was the kind of person that I love meat. And in fact, I thought everything tasted better with bacon fat. So I kept a little pot of bacon fat on my stove. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, a happy meat eater. And then I happened to see a documentary about the way we treat the animals that we eat. And something just shifted inside me. And I could never eat meat or fish or anything that had been alive again. So it's been over 40 years before I've, you know, since I've eaten meat. 
But that really got me thinking, you know, why was I able to overturn a lifelong habit overnight? And people would say, oh, you're so disciplined. That's amazing. And I would say, actually, it's required no discipline whatsoever. It's been one of the easiest things I've ever done. And I wondered why. And that started my quest. And what I now understand is that what happened to me was that without my active participation, I had actually satisfied three psychological needs required for optimal motivation. The kind of optimal motivation or the kind of motivation that enables you to make major shifts in your life to sustain that positive energy over time. And so that's why I wanted to just become an expert in the field and see how I could teach other people how to do that. So what um, I do in Mastering Your Motivation is I actually tell, and if you listen to the Audible book, it's really fun because there's um, 13 different voices of people sharing their stories of how they use the ideas in the book to shift their motivational outlook on things like filling out expense reports or changing a diet or um, being able to network for their job when they were really an introvert and didn't feel like you know networking. So um, I'm hoping that maybe you will consider that during this time of crisis and COVID that I'm gonna just share a screen real quick. And these are what's called the three psychological needs. And this is the research that got me so excited way back when. And this is, um, these are the three psychological needs that we need to have in place in order to thrive, in order to be optimally motivated. And I'd like you just to think about how this is relevant right now in our lives, that if we don't feel like we have choice, oh, I have to wear a mask, oh, I can't go to work, oh, I have to homeschool my kids, you know, we have, we have, a, we can't, um, you know, be with our friends, we have the social distance. If we have that kind of a framework, then our choice is being undermined, and there's no way that we can be optimally motivated as we go through, uh, and we're not going to feel resilient, we're not going to have the grit that it takes to make through these difficult times. If we're not feeling a sense of connection because of that social distancing or because we're not concerned for the greater good, we just have self-interest, then we're not going to be thriving and able to cope effectively with the changes that are happening. And if we don't focus on what we're learning and how we're growing, but if you think about what's happening right now, nobody knows what to do. It's like, it's really confusing. There's a lot of mixed messaging. And so if you don't really understand and pay attention to, for example, credible experts, you might feel lost. So what I hope that you'll notice if you, um, you know, read my book is that it's so relevant to what we're all experiencing right now. And in just the minute that I have left, I just want to share with you that I hope that you might think about gift giving for the holidays. <laughs> so what I've done is, for example, I've done um, health baskets with healthy foods that I've uh, partnered with my book. I actually um, give aromatherapy elixirs because I use an elixir um, metaphor in my book. And so I, I pair the book with aromatherapy. Um, I've given, and, and um, Becky, you'll recognize this journal, but I'm giving a book along with a journal so that people can actually take notes. And then we have um, an author, a children's author today, and I just wanted to show you how I'm using her book. It's about Louie. And so um, I, I got this really cute dog uh, blanket and I'm giving this to my grandchildren. I got three of these. So I got given them to my grandchildren and Denise signed my book to the gr three grandchildren. And I can just imagine us on Christmas Eve, we open up the book, they're all in their cuddly blankets and we're reading it. So I like to pair books with uh, um, ways that people can use them. So I hope that works. And David, I'm going to throw this over to you and let you talk about your book. Terrific, thank you. All right, so my name is David Taylor Klaus, and the book that I wrote is called Mindset Mondays with DTK, 52 Ways to Rewire Your Thinking and Transform Your Life. And, and I, I love what Susan just said about pairing books with things that, you, pairing books with things that make it useful. Um, what I love about this book and that lead in is, I wrote the book that I needed to read. And I wrote the book that's designed to be used. And I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, so, so don't worry, I, I hate PowerPoint slides too. Um, so why are we here? It's the chance to really talk about this book, why this book and why now, and more importantly, how you can fit this into your holiday giving. So what's important about this book is 
we do not see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And there's something very powerful in that, that if we change the lens through which we see the world, call it mindset, then we have the opportunity to change the way we experience the world. So ultimately, COVID or not, the rest of 2020 or not, we're in control of how we experience the world. And the reason this book came to be is these little ones. And now granted, they're a lot larger now. The one on the left just got married a couple weeks ago. Um, but this is why this book is important. Um, I spent a long time as an entrepreneur over calibrating. I was so focused on work. This photo is from the 10th anniversary of the last company that I ran. And I got so focused on work, I lost connection with what was important and who was important. And it left me, it led me to a super dark place, which is very long story short, how I got to coaching in the first place. But here's what's important. What shifted for me was the understanding that I was in control of the way I saw the world. Instead of living a reported on life where things were happening to me, I changed the way I saw the world and I was able to live a created life instead of a reported on life. And what I've done with the book is created 52 readily digestible and immediately actionable chapters with a framework to help people take the learning from that chapter out into the world and make it real. The framework, I tried to make it simple and easy for folks to use. So with each chapter, their rewire framework, their prompts at the end with the rewire framework and rewires that acronym for, first one is reflect. It's giving your yourself the space to consider and dive deep into what you're learning from the chapter, what's coming up for you. And then to experiment with it, They're, each one has a prompt to give you an experiment to go play with in the world. And then to sit down and capture what you learn. There's something different about writing. The actual activity of pen to paper, not on a computer, not on a tablet. Brene Brown says that writing takes it from head to heart to hand to paper. So this is really the opportunity to read, I mean, to write down what you're capturing. And I even give journaling pages behind each chapter so that you can do it in the book. And then to investigate what surfaced by processing it and writing it. And then revising your experiment and taking it back out into the world and learning from that repeated experiment. And then expanding that learning to other areas in your world. The idea is this book is not going to be shelfware and just be pretty up on your shelf, but to be used throughout the year. Every chapter ends with rewire prompts unique for the chapter and a place for you to play with it. And, and actually, this book ended up being one of the hot new releases in journal writing as well as for other groups because it's a journal. But why now? Um, um, you may have noticed 2020 is ripe with upheaval good, bad, who knows, but we've had a lot that we're going through. And this is the opportunity for us to shift our beliefs and shift our behavior to get different results, particularly coming into 2021. I think there are a lot of people that are gonna miss 2020. Um, so what I've looked at is three different ways that you can weave this into your holiday giving. The first one is buy one for yourself. My God, it's an opportunity for new year, new brain. It's a chance for you to rewire and change what your 2021 is gonna look like. Buy one for a friend. Gives you the chance to go through these things together and build an accountability. Or give them to your team. Build trust and create accountability. And the easiest way to do that is either go to Mindset Mondays to learn more about the book and get it there, or to reach out to me to buy the book for your team. Whether they're signed or not, I can make arrangements for that to happen. Um, and that's for me. Actually, Nikki, you've even got a little bit of extra time. So Becky, if there are any questions that came up, we can play with that here, or I can turn this over to Nikki. Uh, David, I think we'll save the questions till the end. Perfect. All right, Nikki, you're up. 
Well, thank you so much, David. It's uh, been so lovely hearing about both your and Susan's books. And I know we have plenty of other wonderful books coming up as well. My name is Nikki Groom, and my book is called A Power of Your Own, How to Ignite Your Potential, Uncover Your Purpose, and Blaze Your Own Trail in Life and Business. Yes, it's a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> but the main part to remember is a power of your own. Well, what does a power of your own mean? Um, quite honestly, this has been a lifetime of discovery for me. I, uh, throughout my life, there have been different points where I've really come up against my inner critic and worried about my capacity to be able to push out of my comfort zone and really reach my fullest potential. And so what I have learned through the, the years is how important it is for, for us to really reckon with that inner critic and realize that oftentimes that inner critic those beliefs that that inner critic entertains are often formed as a result of things that we've heard from the world around us. And particularly as women or anybody who's ever felt underestimated, it's often because the world has told us that we don't measure up or we don't belong. Um, and so I wrote this book, you know, several milestones. When I look back, I just hit 40 literally this week. So I'm celebrating that this month. And what better way than to celebrate with my first book. When I look back at my life, uh, you know, my first job, I got a job as a marketing manager when I was 22 and I had no idea what I was doing. I had no marketing qualifications and a little voice in my head thought, well, Nikki, you're, you're nuts. You know, you're not going to be able to do this. And somehow I managed to overcome when I moved from the US to the UK. I had a similar experience. And then when I started my own business eight years ago, um, I kind of came up against a lot of those same beliefs again. So I do have a video actually that talks a little bit more about my book and kind of digs into some more of these concepts. Of course, we're doing this live, so there's the potential that something could go wrong. Uh, so Becky is, is stand, on standby with some questions in case we have any technical difficulties, but I'd love to share this book with you. It was filmed uh, several weeks ago during a socially distanced uh, book launch event with some of my best friends. Um, and so I'll share that with you. And then if we have a little bit of time, I'd love to field any of your questions that you might have, um, or potentially, again, if we do have enough time, maybe read a little snippet from the book itself. Um, and by the way, I absolutely loved Susan's idea of what this might pair with. I talk a lot in the book about self-care. This could be, that could be a great way to pair a gift with the book. You know, maybe um, some essential oils or bath salts or something like that. Uh, but anyway, over to the video. There it is. I think something that we so easily forget is that we are already powerful and we just don't realize it. Today we're here for the launch of my first book, A Power of Your Own, and I'm so excited because honestly there were parts during my book writing journey when I never even knew if this book would see the light of day. It definitely was a journey of grappling with my self-doubt and really owning my own power and potential and realizing I can do this. And I really want this event to be an invitation for people to step into their fullest potential, uncover their purpose and blaze their own trail without waiting for anyone's apology. Whenever we're really striving for our dreams, whether that be in business or elsewhere, when we're really stepping into that role of leader, there's kind of this messy middle where you're still figuring things out. And I think that a lot of us can give ourselves a really hard time for that. It's normal and it's okay to be in that messy middle, to be struggling, to feel like you're all alone. You're not all alone. Like there's so many other people who are in that with you. And I think we need to normalize the fact that there is kind of this messy period when you're figuring things out. In fact, I always say that no one has everything figured out. So we need to kind of cut ourselves some slack. I think that's so often we've internalized these beliefs from the rest of the world about who especially as women we should be or shouldn't be or what we should do or shouldn't do and that causes us to internalize those beliefs and hold ourselves back and so um, I'm just so happy to have not only written this book published this book to be able to hold this book in my hand and say yes I did it but also to hold this event tonight because I really feel like it's 
not so much about me and my book, it's about all of us. So many of us identify with that inner critic who says, you can't do this, you're not good enough, who do you think you are? And that definitely reflects how I have felt or the voice that I have heard at several points along my journey when I left the UK for the States um, and when I started my own business and when I pivoted in my business and started doing something that I felt really passionately about. I realized that whenever we're doing something that really means something to us, that when something's really important to us, that's when we hear our inner critic. And what I've come to realize is that that inner critic often is generated by the world outside. So who the world tells us that we can and can't be, um, when the world tells us that we do or don't belong, when the world tells us like, you're not good enough, you don't deserve to have this. My book is for sale basically anywhere <laughs> that you buy books. Um, you can ask for it and they can get a copy. You can also find it on Amazon, A Power of Your Own. You can search for Nikki Groom, whatever's easiest. I also just relaunched my website. It literally went live today. So you can find me at nikkigroom.com. I'm also on social media everywhere at Nikki Groom and, uh, and I love engaging and connecting with people on there. Um, I also am hoping that some people who hear the message of the book will want to really explore what it means to uncover their purpose and deepen into the work that's calling them forward. The book talks a lot about the imposter complex. So many women, particularly high functioning, high performing women, struggle with thinking that they're not good enough, they're a fraud. And my good friend Tanya Geisler, who's an expert in the imposter complex, says if you think that you're a fraud, you're actually not because real frauds don't think that they're a fraud and so it tackles a lot of that around self-doubt and overcoming those limiting beliefs so that you can really embrace your full potential and do everything that you want in the world and it seems that that brought us perfectly to time um, i think i have a few minutes left uh, possibly but um, would absolutely love to connect with any of you on social media if you have more questions. Um, but yes, I, I think uh, we're ready to hand off to Denise. If Denise, if you're ready to, uh, to jump in here. It's because I talked at the beginning, so I, I lost sense of timing. <laughs> I'm good. Thanks, Nikki. Wow, that was awesome. And so my, um, my little co-author who was with me right behind me exited stage left, um, always has perfect timing hence why I'm the author and he's co-author. Um, but I'm super excited to be here with you today. And I love this whole idea. Thank you, Becky and Weaving Influence. You guys have been such a great team. So I'm here to talk today about my little book called Louie's Little Legs. And thanks, Susan, for that shout out. So Louie's Little Legs was kind of a, a progression of a lot of different ideas and thoughts and you know, books that I've written and blogs that I've written, and it's all based on my rescue pup. But let me just share with you a video that I think will give you a much better idea of, um, hold on, oops, I don't want to do that. Hold on. Sorry, I had this all down, didn't I? No worries, we'll get there. All right. Puff Louie and his real Oops, life. Let me start over. I adopted Lou Denise de Stassi, author of <laughs> Lead Like Louie, Love Like Louie, and our latest book, which is Louie's Little Legs. All of our Louie material is based on my rescue pup, Louie, and his real life antics. I adopted Louie in 2013, and his challenging behaviors concerned me until I chose to love him, and the transformation was amazing for him and for me as well. Children learn a valuable lesson about love and kindness and not to jump so quickly to disliking someone or judging them. In our story, his little legs take him to very fun places. While frolicking in the meadow, Louie runs into a cat he despises. His pal, Stitchy, helps Louie understand how to treat others with kindness and not to be mean. Louie learns a magical secret to being kind. There is always something unknown in other people's lives. You never know, they might be having a very tough time, just like Coco the cat in the story. Louie's Little Legs is magical, the illustrations are captivating, and Louie's little personality will melt your heart.
We offer special packages for churches, schools, and nonprofits. The books can be purchased through Amazon or through our website, which is unleash-love.com. Thanks so much. We hope to see you soon. So that's my little video that kind of gives you a little background, but it also shows the incredible illustrations that children absolutely love. And the illustrations were done with the team of Weaving Influence. So I'm super proud to present this book. And I know I kind of laugh about Lou being challenging, but honestly, he was super challenging. And my time with him was transfer transformative when I started to really choose to love him, not only did I have to choose to keep him, I had to make a choice to love him. Now you think, I know loving dogs should be super easy to do. It was a challenge. I filmed him actually getting into my laundry basket because he would do things like get into the laundry basket, which was a cute thing. But then he would start this aggression toward me when I would try to do things for him. And I had to get a trainer in. The trainer had actually worked with me in some leadership capacities, and he said, Denise, guru, leadership guru, uh, you may actually learn a couple leadership lessons from this little dog, so you might want to take some notes. And I thought, all right. I started taking notes. I started blogging. I put together a leadership book. And from that leadership book, my granddaughter, who was about nine years old at the time, said, no, no, you probably should write a kid's book. And I said, oh, okay. So we wrote a book for middle grade kids. And then based on that, we wrote the, the children's book, Louie's Little Legs. And the characters in there are real, obviously Louie. And he's got a pal named Stitchy. And Stitchy's the one who gives him the wise words that you just never know. There might be something going on that we don't know about. And I thought it's a perfect message for kids. It's a perfect message for adults. I probably hear from a lot more adults how much they love the story and how much they love the message. And I think in our world today, if we can't wrap our arms around being kind, we're not gonna be, we're not gonna help anybody. And so it's a simple message. It's done really beautifully well. And it's a great little story. And so it's, it's something that I'm proud to, um, to display and proud to share and proud to, um, you know, let you all know about. Again, our, our website is called unleash-love.com. Unleash, obviously, because of the dog. Unleash-love.com. And I'm really, really blessed to be able to be here with you guys and to share this. And we do have some giveaways that I know that they'll be talking about in a little bit. And um, also, if there's any... If there's any way you want me to do a story time via Zoom for kids, if you've got an organization you want to donate books to, please contact me. Again, that information will be in, in, our, um, in the final panel, um, in the final slide and information. But I'm really blessed and really pleased to be able to share it. If you have any questions whatsoever, get in touch with us and I'll be happy to, to share with you. So thanks again, Becky, for letting us do this. And I am going to hand this over to the capable hands of Charles and Susan. Great. Thank you so much, Denise. Uh, I'm Susan Mann. This is my husband, Charles Bergman. We are delighted to be here with these other authors and Weaving Influences team to talk about Chuck's book, Every Penguin in the World, A Quest to See Them All. Just click on it. Just click. One just, moment. Just click. <laughs> just click. Just click. Uh, did you click it? Well, we were set up. Just a second. If you hover near the bottom, Susan and Charles, you should see the arrow so that you can advance the slides, or sometimes the space bar also works. There we go. Now we're off and running. Thank you, sorry, <laughs> here we go. Every Penguin in the World is a history of an accidental but thoroughly wonderful obsession. It's an honor to be part of this holiday showcase and it's a pleasure to tell you a bit about our new book, which by the way has been endorsed as you can see on the cover by Jane Goodall and even Brene Brown. 
Chuck and I undertook this quest to see all 18 of the world's penguin species in the wild. It ended up being a 17 year long journey and we did meet our goal. We were privileged to meet some of the most incredible birds and see some of the most amazing places on the planet. This is us here with two emperor penguins at Snow Hill, Antarctica a couple of years ago. We had unbelievably cool experiences like this once in a lifetime sunset in the Antarctic Peninsula. We were in some of the most beautiful and magical locations on the planet. Uh, like this world of blues and ice, also in Antarctica. And unbelievably incredible wildlife encounters like this sunset over Gentoo penguins in the Falkland Islands. The quest to see all 18 penguin species in the wild wasn't something that we originally planned. We just wanted to go to wild places and see penguins, but we became completely obsessed with them. Our quest developed <laughs> gradually over years because the penguins proved themselves to be utterly irresistible. Emperor penguin chicks, for example, have an incredible charm. I think they may be the cutest animal babies in the world. And we discovered that penguins will call you to these really great adventures. And if you answer their call, they'll change us. Those, they certainly did change us. Every penguin in the world tells the story of what we learned about penguins, but also how they changed us. The book is fact friendly story-driven and full of 170 gorgeous photos. I can brag a bit about my husband here. Chuck's an award-winning photographer and writer. The photos are just beautiful. Uh, all of the species and some of the most remote places in the world. One of the things that I love most about this book is it shows us how penguins are living lessons in our love for the planet and all of its creatures in their beauty and their vulnerability. We went to some of the most remote places on the planet. You'll see us here a few years ago, standing on the uh, shore of Tristan da Cunha, which is roughly halfway between South America and the African continent. It's in the middle of nowhere in the Atlantic Ocean. And that we had to figure out a way to get to those islands and it wasn't easy. So we could see rockhopper, the Northern rockhopper, which is species number 18. Another example, a red crested penguin is 500 miles off the coast of New Zealand. How do you get there? Well, we figured out a way. We love the, the red crested penguins because they're the only penguins that can raise and lower their crests. <laughs> they have total control of the crest. They're the only one. <laughs> So it wasn't just adventure. We discovered that conservation for penguins is critical. People love penguins, of course, but I don't think many people realize just how endangered they are. Of the current 18 species of penguins, 11 are declining, 10 are already listed as endangered, and believe me, several more are on the way. They're gonna be on the list within the next few years. Simple but important question, a haunting question really, if we can't save what we love, and everybody loves penguins, what in the world can we save? King penguins, which you see here, are a particular favorite of ours among the 18 penguin species. I love this photograph of this mated pair, a male and female king penguin on the beautiful pebbled beach of Macquarie Island, which is a few hundred miles south of Australia. So I'd like to tell a story about one king penguin and it was the penguin that changed my life. And it will tell you something about why I wrote the book and why we think you might like it. Both Susan and I agree that perhaps the most beautiful place in the world, certainly the most beautiful place we've ever been to is South Georgia Island. It's located 900 miles from the uh, South American continent absolutely gorgeous place and we were early on shore one morning in St. Andrews Bay here and I wanted to photograph this scene, the scene you're looking at. I wanted this photograph, the one you're looking at, because it captured to me something of the wild beauty of the island and the birds. I got down on my stomach 
so I could get a nice low angle to get the reflections as well as the mountains in the sky and crawled forward with my elbows. And while I was taking a series of photos, I realized in fact that something was pecking at me from behind. I couldn't see it, it was pecking at my boots and then it pecked at my pants jerked my jacket and I realized it came right up and was standing right by my face looking at me. These are three foot tall penguins, so they're big. And it was kind of an interesting moment. And while I was looking back at it, the penguin raised its beak and began calling, this hoarse throaty call. And the weird thing was when it was calling, I knew what it was saying. It was actually speaking to me and I knew literally what it was saying. You may wonder how penguins find each other. For example, these penguins nest in enormous colonies, up to 200,000 breeding pairs at one time. How does a, a pair of penguins find each other or the chick find its parents in all this when they get separated? And the answer is one of those wonderful facts of science. It's in their call. Each one of those penguins has a unique call that is utterly different from all the rest. And in that call, it is telling you, this is me. Here I am. I'm right here and it expects a response. In other words, the identity of an individual bird is inscribed in that call. And they expect a response. This was a really powerful moment for me, a really deeply ethical moment, because I wanted to give a response that was worthy. I wanted to give a genuine response or what you might say, a response that is responsible. I believe creatures call us to our deepest selves. And this book is my answer to that king penguin. They taught me and us a lot about heart and soul and hope. And that's how this became not just a call to adventure or even conservation, but a spiritual quest, a pilgrimage for something sacred and transformative in the world. So nature's calling to us. Penguins and the planet, in fact, the whole world is in our hands like this little baby white flippered penguin. And we, we hope you'll look at, take a look at the book and see more about it. Right. We hope you'll buy every penguin in the world. There are great photos to enjoy, wonderful stories. Go forward to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we've worked hard to do is provide a lot of great free resources on the Every Penguin book page off Chuck's website. You'll see that address here. So there's a reader's guide for book clubs. There's an educational guide with questions that can be used for youngsters. We've had a lot of parents using this with their kids as they're doing the homeschooling through the pandemic. And there are other wonderful resources as well. Chuck also speaks to book clubs and other groups. So if you go to the book page, you'll find all kinds of information that will help you get started with every penguin in the world. Yep. All right. Thanks. And we will turn it over now to Laura. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. And what a wonderful set of authors. Um, I'm very humbled and honored to, to follow all of them. Um, I'm Laura Starks. The book I'll be talking about is um, called The Second Law. It's the third in a series of energy thrillers. And to tell you about how it arose um, and kind of what it's about, I, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in Boston and grew up in northern Oklahoma, which is a pretty big contrast right there. I now live in Dallas excuse me, Texas. I always enjoyed writing, but figured it wouldn't pay the bills. So since I grew up in a refinery town, it was natural for me as it was for many women and men to go to engineering school. I earned a chemical engineering bachelor's degree from New Orleans Tulane University, which is one of the key settings in um, the second law. I decided after working for a while in refineries, I decided I didn't want to do refinery engineering full time. And so I got a finance MBA from the University of Chicago and I'm getting to the writing part, I promise. 
On the nonfiction side, I look at energy investments for a couple of platforms at an invest in, investing site called Seeking Alpha. Um, I've also written technical articles um, in, in, in uh, print publications, and I was named a um, co-inventor of a U.S. patent for a catalyst called lithium alumina. So really, I've just always combined the science side with um, writing and with the entertainment and very powerful impact of the written word. Since I've uh, worked for companies you would recognize, very well-known companies in engineering and marketing and planning, that all kind of prepared me to write these uh, energy thrillers that you see on the screen. And, you know, I'm fortunate they've won some awards. As all uh, writers uh, come to these days, I've um, appeared at over 150 book marketing events. We all know that writing um, includes marketing. And um, in a prior life, not a prior life, a few years ago, I served as the co-chair, investment oversight chair and treasurer of the Friends, not all at the same time, um, at the Friends of the Dallas Public Library. And that was a, a very meaningful contribution for me. And I've, um, I've run about uh, 16 half marathons and I'm working on the fourth Lynn Dayton thriller. And frankly, those things are quite a bit alike. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a long run. The key concept of these books, a little bit of education, um, hopefully that goes down easy about the sky, what I would call the sky high risks of the energy world with a really heavy component of suspense and entertainment. So who, who would, who, you know, who does this, this book, a book like this speak to? Really everyone, all of us who heat our homes in the winter, who put gasoline or eventually electricity into our car, um, who travel, we hope, soon again by jet. Um, anytime we go to the, to the grocery store, um, all of the food and supplies that we buy have arrived by trucks. That's all energy. It's, all, it's, a, it's kind of the spine of the world, if you will. So this third book that I'm showing, let's see, I'll show it here, and I think I'll, you'll see it at the end also, The Second Law. So what does the title mean? The second law is a, is a kind of a code, not really, and it refers to the second law of thermodynamics. And what's that? Well, in it, at its essence, the second law of thermodynamics is perfect for a thriller because it says everything tends toward chaos. So there we go. Um, what is the second law about? The protagonist in the series is a woman named Lynn Dayton, and no, she's not me. Um, she's a, a an energy executive and she's, when the book starts, she's visiting the company's um, San Francisco refinery and it comes under attack. Um, she's very upset, of course, by the deaths of several workers there. And she traces the explosion to the software malfunctions and what's called the internet of things, you know, which, which you know from your house. And there's also an industrial internet of things, which are control systems. So, you know, short, shorthand, that's what's going on. She gets in touch with a cybersecurity specialist and they track to, to find out, you know, where are these coming from? Um, it's a thriller. Lynn races against time to uncover what turns out to be a complex plot. It goes from murder in Vienna to the Baltic uh, to major Caribbean. Uh, installation offshore, and of course, the primary settings are New Orleans and San Francisco. Unless she can figure out the plot, thousands more people are scheduled to die. So what's, what's the theme here? It's high stakes, energy sabotage, with lives of thousands of people at risk. I've sometimes asked about, you know, what are, what are some of the, what are, what are the secrets? You know, what are the secrets in the book? And of course, there are a lot of them that, you know, unwind, including, you know, who, who particularly has set the plot in motion and what it is. But I, I have two kind of fun secrets. One is, the first one is, is doppelgangers. And a doppelganger, as you may know, is, it's, a, 
It's an apparition or it's a double of a living person. And as it turns out, I have a doppelganger, which I only realized maybe a few years ago. Um, I've been mistaken for her. There is a Laura T. Starks, who's a professor of finance in Austin, Texas. Um, I didn't, so in the book, I didn't want actual twins, but instead two somewhat similar people who take different paths. And it turns out that there are two sets of doppelgangers in the second law. And the second secret, and I'll kind of circle back here to Susan, um, is that bacon can be used as a weapon, seriously. And that's all for me. Thank you so much. I hope you'll head out and, and buy the books for yourself and your friends um, as entertainment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And I'm going to invite the rest of our panelists back on camera and back off mute um, so that we can go now to some <clears throat> Q, some Q&A time. And um, if you have questions specifically for authors who are on the call, you can feel free to type those in the chat. I would encourage you to use the drop down menu and select all panelists and attendees so everyone can um, hear your comments. But before we go to any questions and while people are typing those in, I just want to pause for a moment because we had such a great diverse group of books and authors represented and so many inspiring moments throughout today's event. And uh, for those of you who may not have been watching the chat, lots of comments during every presentation about uh, the relevance and interest or the beautiful photos or the cute dog or uh, the inspiring video from Nikki and um, just a wide range of comments. And um, so it's, it's really fun to be a part of an event like this. Um, so uh, just uh, some reactions from those of you who have been on the panel so far. Susan, you look like you're ready to say something. <laughs> Which Susan? <laughs> oh, Fowler, I, I met you. <laughs> I was looking at myself. Do I look like I'm ready to say something? Well, um, again, I, you guys just all sold a book because uh, I'm I'm ordering every one of these books. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, so thank you for that. But you know what? One of the things I noticed in the the chat was people talking about authors' passion, mm -hmm. and I think you know I live by a quote that's I teach what I most need to learn. And I think that every single one of us uh, today would, would probably echo that. Yeah. So these are personal books, but we have a deep desire to, to write something that's not just personal, but it's meaningful to others. And I, I just really appreciate that. Thank you, Susan. That, that helps. Um, so we are open for your questions. If any of you have questions for each other, that's a fair game as well. Some of you are unmuted and some of you aren't. Um, I did um, want to circle back to a question for David Taylor Klaus uh, that I saw earlier in, in the segment. And David, I've heard you say before that you hate the term work-life balance. Oh. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, why you think work-life balance is killing us. God, just hearing the phrase makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I've been on on some intense conversations on LinkedIn and Facebook about that today. Um, I think the idea of work-life balance is insane. I'm not sure whose idea it was to put the word work first, but that's really got us thrown off. It's We're over-calibrated towards paying attention to work, and we sort of jam our life into the spaces left over around it. And that's we are not here to work to live, or I mean, we're not here to live to work. The opportunity is to look less for balance because, oh my God, to balance two things, first you have to separate them. And even before the pandemic, good luck with that. I mean, the opportunity is to look for a rhythm, right? A rhythm in our life. And it's not just between work and life. It's between family and faith and community and work and life. And trying to find a rhythm that works for all of that together. If we can get rid of work-life balance and swap that term for life rhythm, I think it sets us up to be more successful in finding a way to move through, whether it's 2020 or whatever else comes up. Hey, hey, Becky, can I just build on what David just said? Because I've been saying this for years and I, I'm so excited to hear you say that. <laughs> Because from the motivation science perspective, yeah. 
it doesn't matter whether it's work or life or play or whatever you want to label it, as long as you're having your needs for choice, connection, and competence, if your psychological needs are being satisfied, you're going to have a sense of peace, joy, um, mental and physical wellness. And so this, this um, artificial, uh, like you say, um, categorization of our life is, is a false dichotomy that um, doesn't serve us. So yay for yeah, you. It's constraining. So yeah, yeah. thanks for building yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Nikki, did you have something you wanted to add to? No, I'm probably nodding away because I totally agree with this too. A friend of mine talks about it in terms of full life integration, because you're totally right. You know, why do we, especially if we're really passionate about what we're doing, there's, there's, it's hard to kind of draw those lines around, you know, well, where does work life, where does work finish and life start? Um, and so I'm really passionate about helping people to really figure out ways to work that are nourishing and fulfilling mm. and don't detract from, you know, how you feel, your, your well-being and, and, and all of that. So I think it's such an important conversation and uh, I think we need to have it more often. Yeah. Thanks. So um, let's see, a couple of uh, questions for some of our other authors. Um, Charles, uh, one of the things I'm curious about is if you can remind us which of those penguin uh, species is your favorite? Yeah. Well, it's a tough call, of course. Um, we really love king penguins, the ones with the golden ear patch and the one that spoke to me particularly and I also love the emperor penguin chicks. How do you not love them? Yeah. So those are probably the top two. Um, one that people don't usually think of is the gentoo penguin, which I spent a lot of many, many hours in the company of gentoo penguins because they're very playful. And one of my favorite things was to, in the Falkland Islands, watch them catch waves as they came ashore. They would actually surf in, in the big waves as they came ashore go airborne as they surfed on them and then come to shore. And then the same penguin would swim back out and do it again. They would play back and forth in the, in the surf. And I just love that about Gentoo penguins. They have a good life rhythm, David. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I was just thinking that we all need more play. Yeah. Uh, Amen. It's so cool. So Susan, I loved what you did and your generosity in shouting out uh, Denise's book. Okay. And, uh, um, for those of you who might be thinking more about gift ideas, one of the things that my team and I decided to do since we had a part in creating the book, uh, Louis Little Legs, is we're donating some copies of the book to some local schools in our district. Unfortunately, they've all gone to virtual as of this week, um, so it might, may be a while before the kids are back in the classroom and can read the book um, in the classroom, but um, we are, you know, thrilled to be able to use that as a way of giving back at the holidays. So for those of you who are listening and intrigued by these books, you may be uh, thinking about groups that you could buy the book to donate the book to. Um, and then you could add, you could add a box of uh, plastic gloves and masks to the book so they can read them together. There you go. <laughs> Love that. that is a great idea. Well, and think about groups that, you know, each of these books um, might be applicable for groups. Mm -hmm. And someone um, is talking about uh, the penguins. And um, so hopefully you'll see that in the chat, Susan and yeah. Charles, or we can share that later. Um, so Laura, I'm super intrigued by the way you have uh, fueled this passion for writing and turned to fiction after doing a lot of technical writing and work in the world. And so I'm curious how much realism is in your books? You know, how I've always heard that phrase, write what you know. Um, so Laura, you know, how much are you writing what you know and how, how easily do those stories come um, when you're writing this series? That's, a, that's a, a, a great question. And my first drafts, and I went through many, um, first sounded like technical manuals. And so I really had to change my style. Um, I took out all the boring meetings um, and anything that was too long added, added a lot of action. The real difference, there's, there's a lot of, there's, you know, they take place sort of in current time. The real difference is that the probabilities are different, right? In, in real life, you're trying to keep the bad stuff from happening. Mm -hmm. In fiction, the bad stuff happens. If it can happen, it will. So that's the difference. That's a great reflection. Thank you. So I want to turn for a moment back to our slides and 
we want to tell you some ways that you can stay in touch with these authors. Um, so starting with Susan, we would invite you to visit SusanFowler.com to access as many of the hundreds of resources she's created, including blogs, articles, webinars, podcasts, and videos. Um, we would also invite you to take Susan's free What's Your MO survey, What's Your Motivational Outlook? Is that right? Did I get that That's right? right. You did. Um, I, I ought to after so many years. Um, and... <laughs> And if you purchase 10 or more hard copy, Audible, or Kindle versions of either of Susan's book, uh, she'd be happy to send you a free virtual book club discussion guide. And Jenny at SusanFowler.com can give you more information about that. And don't worry if I'm clicking through the slides quickly, we will be sending a copy of this slide deck out with our follow-up email. So next up, uh, David Taylor Klaus. Uh, David invites you to visit Mindset Mondays with DTK.com to learn more and order the book. You can also download the Rewire Framework, or you can buy uh, Mindset Mondays with DTK um, for your team or organization in bulk. And David said the best way to do that is through him. So here's Nikki, A Power of Your Own, Nikki Groom. You can buy the book on Amazon. You can also download the first chapter on her newly launched launched website. And you can follow Nikki on Instagram, which is something that I do and enjoy. Uh, always inspired by you, Nikki. So uh, hopefully everyone else will follow you as well. Denise DeStazzi and Louie's Little Lay. Um, so Denise will provide a PDF with questions that you can ask your child as you read to them. And you can buy the book um, at this link and use the code family friends, apparently for a discount, maybe Denise, exactly. what will that code do? Uh, yeah, that'll give you a discount. I, th I believe it'll be 20%. Plus, I also have one for nonprofits. Below. Got it. I see that. So if there's an organization that you'd like to donate a book to, um, Denise can help you with that. Uh, I think, Denise, I saw your announcement earlier this week that you just uh, finished and moved closer to having a nonprofit for this work. So yeah. it's so exciting. And if you'd like to invite Denise for a story time with your child's class, you can contact Denise directly at her email address that's listed here. Mm -hmm. Charles Bergman and Susan Mann, uh, you can buy the book and write a review. Um, Amazon reviews are helpful to all of our authors. You can sign up for the blog at charlesbergman.com and the first five to sign up will get a free penguin pack. Mm -hmm. You can join an upcoming free penguin talk. Those are listed on Charles Bergman's website or, and you can download the Make a Difference card and do something to help the natural worlds. Uh, finally, uh, Laura Starks, you can buy the book, The Second Law in print or Kindle format. It happens to be number three in the series. So I think once you buy the number three, you're going to want to buy number one and two so you can catch up on the story up to that point. And you can also sign up for Laura's newsletter and view book trailers at lastarksbooks.com and you can join Laura at Goodreads for book reviews and other occasional promotions. So before we end, I do want to let you know that we have another book, a holiday book showcase event coming up next week with another uh, set of diverse authors uh, with various topics. We have Esther Derby. Her book is about change in organizations. We have Eileen McDar. Her book is about uh, burnout and resilience. Julie Winkle Giulioni has a book about career development. Uh, Nate Regeer, a book about personality structure. Uh, David and Victoria Poval uh, are some fiction authors who will be a part of next week's call. And then we will finish up next week by the way, these are in no particular order. Um, but we also have Ed Adams and Ed Frauenheim, and they have a recent book called Redefining Masculinity. Uh, which is really timely. And uh, they recently had an op-ed in USA Today talking about um, different types of masculinity. So a uh, wide range of books and, and authors next week. If you haven't already signed up, we will give you the link um, in the chat, maybe if we have it ready or in the follow-up email so you can sign up for next week's uh, holiday book showcase event. Um, I want to wish you all a healthy and safe holiday season, and I do hope that you will uh, choose to add one or all of the books from today's event to your holiday shopping list. So thank you, authors. I'm privileged to work with each of you. It's so fun to try this out with you, and I look forward to what's ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. A real Bye. pleasure. Take care.